of a few minutes to Christmas Day, we greet viewers throughout the British Isles and invite them to High Mass from the chapel of Ashall College in County Durham. The college is set 600 feet above sea level, four miles west of Durham City, and it has been the great training college for Roman Catholic priests for the north of England since it was built in 1808. Its history and traditions go back nearly 400 years, however, to the founding in 1568 by Cardinal Allen of Dowie College in northeast France for the purpose of training priests for the English mission, continuance of which in this country was being hindered by the attempts of Queen Elizabeth I and her government to destroy the Roman Catholic faith. In this way, Roman Catholicism in England was kept from extinction until, in turn, the anti-religious nature of the French Revolution made it impossible for the college in France to continue. And after suffering hardships and privations, priests and students returned to their native land where they were now able to practice their religion with freedom. Many of them occupied various temporary residences in northwest Durham until they settled here at Ashaw in 1808 with 30 students where today nearly 400 drawn from all the northern counties are in residence. The college is largely self-supporting, having its own farms, hospital and post office, and though exposed to a cold northwest wind from the Pennines, a warm spirit of Christian fellowship glows here always. The college library, built 110 years ago, contains nearly 40,000 books, of which over 100 were printed before the year 1500. And it includes the archives of the Vicar's Apostolic of the North, and displays among relics and medieval manuscripts a charter signed by King John and some of the original manuscripts of the poet Francis Thompson who had his teaching here. The college's most treasured possessions are relics representing nearly 500 saints, the last cassock and stole worn by Pope Pius X, bequeathed by his Secretary of State, himself a one-time student at Ashall and St. Cuthbert's Ring, too. The refectory, where the students have their meals, is a hall of noble proportions which are enhanced by a marble floor, by stained glass windows, portraits of former presidents and of Cardinal Allen, the founder of Dowie College, and a great fireplace in which tonight a yule log burns brightly. From a stone lectern on the right, readings are delivered during meals. The hall at Ashall was for 39 years its first chapel and three bishops were consecrated and 167 priests ordained in it during that time. Today it is an assembly room and it's used for meetings and particularly at this time of year for academic and dramatic productions. In the roof are figures of saints holding the symbols of the arts of which they are patrons. Amongst the college's many chapels is that of St. Aloysius, within the precincts of the junior college. Cheerful and elegant, it contains an exquisite statue of Our Lady with a child Jesus at her knee. The chapel of St. Joseph is used by the college domestic staff, and those living in the neighborhood can attend Mass here too. The windows at the side portray the patron saints of the different classes of the college, whilst the reredos and the window above it illustrate the life of St. Joseph. In the antechapel here is a graceful oak screen given by the poet Coventry Patpaw, and a beautiful marble statue of Our Lady of Help carved with purity and delicacy from a single block of marble by the Jewish sculptor Hoffman a convert to the faith.
This Andy Chapel leads to the chapel of St. Cuthbert, as the college chapel is known, where this high mass is about to be celebrated. Its dimensions give it a great dignity which is enhanced and beautified by slender shafts of bath stone which extend from above the inward-facing stalls, past windows, many of which depict the northern bishops and saints, to the lofty painted roof. It is the second chapel to occupy this site and the third the college has had, and it incorporates much of the material of its predecessor. For its full length, the seating is arranged as for a choir, with benches facing across the chapel for the singing of the divine office in the traditional manner of the collegiate church. Amongst the pinnacles of the 40-foot high altar stand angels with uplifted trumpets, and before it on the broad sanctuary, bishops of Hexham and Newcastle, wearing St. Cuthbert's ring, have ordained hundreds of priests who continue in a modern world to teach God's good tidings, which St. Aidan brought to Lindisfarne and for which the martyrs of Dai died. In her long history, Ashaw has given to the church many great men, six cardinals, four of whom, including Cardinal Godfrey, the present archbishop, have ruled the archdiocese of Westminster, and Archbishop Keenan of Liverpool, all knelt in this chapel as students. On the right, or epistle side of the sanctuary, is a gracious statue of Our Lady with open palms, lifting, as it were, the prayers of this house of God to Him. Every evening, at the last prayers of the day, the students turn to the statue and sing, Maria Marta Graziae, Mary, Mother of Grace, before they leave the chapel. This, then, is the sacred and historic place from whence High Mass comes to you at this midnight before Christmas. And with the service about to begin, a former student of the college, the Reverend Father Daniel Costa, takes over from me to explain, during the Mass, its order and its ritual. his unworthiness, his sinfulness. He confesses to Almighty God, to the Virgin Mary, the sinless one, to Saint Michael, the Archangel, who overthrew Satan, to Saint John the Baptist, who preached repentance, to the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, and to the whole court of heaven. message of this Christmas Mass is, the Lord said to me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee.
reverently the priest kisses the altar, for here is the meeting place between God and man. And this great reverence for the altar of God is emphasized in the incensing which follows. which mean, Lord have mercy on us, Christ have mercy on us. ring out a joyful accompaniment to the hymn of the angels on the first Christmas night. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will.
raised our hearts to God, our Creator, as the choir raised their voices to Him. With them we praise Him, we bless Him, we adore Him, we glorify Him, we thank Him. welcomes us all with the ancient Christian greeting, the Lord be with you. Now the beautiful prayer of Christmas, O God, who has made this most sacred night glow with the radiance of the true light, we pray thee 
grant that we may share to the full in heaven the joys of that light whom we have known sacramentally on earth and who is God. The subdeacon prepares to sing the epistle taken from St. Paul's epistle to Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. and of holiness. We were to look forward, blessed in our hope, to the day when there will be a new dawn of glory, the glory of the great God, the glory of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to ransom us from our guilt, a people set apart for himself, ambitious of noble deeds. By this thy message, this thy encouragement, in Christ Jesus our Lord. is placed upon the altar so that Christ's words may come to us from the very place at which he is to offer himself in sacrifice.
incense is blessed, and in a moment or two, it will be offered up as a mark of reverence to the book of the Gospels and Psalms. The deacon kneels and prays, asking God to cleanse his heart and his lips, so that he may worthily proclaim the Holy Gospel. procession moves into place for the singing of the gospel. Candles are borne by the acolytes to remind us that the gospel is the light of the world. second chapter of St. Luke's Gospel tells the story of the birth of Christ. Joseph and Mary came to Bethlehem for the census ordered by the Emperor Augustus. And it was there that the time came for Mary to give birth to her child. She brought forth a son, her firstborn, whom she wrapped in his swaddling clothes and laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same country, there were shepherds awake in the fields, keeping night watches over their flocks. And all at once, an angel of the Lord came and stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, so that they were overcome with fear. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Behold, the news I bring you is good news of great rejoicing for the whole people. This day in the city of David, a Saviour has been born for you, the Lord Christ himself. This is a sign by which you are to know him. You will find the child still in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then, on a sudden, a multitude of heavenly army appear to them at the angel's side, giving praise to God and saying, Glory to God in high heaven, and peace on earth to men that are God's friends. <laughs> Lord. 
priest kisses the book of the gospel and says, through the gospel words, may our sins be wiped away. by the Holy Ghost from the Virgin Mary and was made He was also crucified for our sake and suffered under Pontius Pilate to the dead. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and of his reign there will be no end. I believe too in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and life giver, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, and who spoke to the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
faithful by presenting to God the bread and wine that are to be changed into the body and blood of Christ. chalice and to it is added a drop of water. That drop of water symbolizes our offering in this great sacrifice of the Mass. bread and wine 
have been incensed out of reverence. And for the same reason, the altar. The priest, too, has been incensed. And now, the whole congregation. The deacon carries to them a message. And that message is, may the Lord kindle within us the fire of his love and the flame of everlasting charity. of the word made flesh, we see God in the visible form. And so we join with the whole court of heaven and sing that endless hymn of praise. identical prayer that St. Augustine prayed when he said Mass for the first time in Canterbury nearly 1400 years ago. The priest prays for the whole church and especially for those who are present at this Mass. Briefly, he pauses to pray for all those who have asked his prayers. We too can do just that. Pray for our families, our friends, the people we work with, the sick people who live in our street. Pray for all those who are away from home this Christmas, on the seas, in the forces, in hospital, or in prison.
the bell rings to announce to us that the great moment of the consecration is approaching. The priest spreads his hands over the chalice and host, earnestly invoking God's blessing on this offering he is about to make. takes into his hands the host, recalls and does just what Christ did at the Last Supper. For the day before he died, took bread into his holy hands, and giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body. We adore, praise, and acknowledge Christ now present on the altar. In like manner, after he had supped, the taking the chalice into his holy hands, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink ye all of this, for this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith. In the chalice that you see raised up, is the very blood of Christ. invites us all to say with him the very prayer taught to us by Christ himself. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. hands a sacred host, the priest breaks it over the chalice. Our Lord broke the bread at the Last Supper, and it was in the breaking of bread on the road to Emmaus that the disciples recognized the Lord. <laughs> St. John the Baptist, we call on our Lord as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and we ask him to have mercy on us and to give us his peace, the peace of the Christ child. The choir puts into song this prayer of ours. with one another. The kiss of peace is passed from one to another with a greeting. Peace be to you. An ancient Christian greeting dating back to apostolic times.
approach the altar to receive Holy Communion. And the priest shows them Christ, whom they are to receive. Lord, proclaim their own unworthiness. Lord, I am not worthy. Lord, I am not worthy. continues while row after row of the students come to the altar to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. This is their very own personal share in this Christmas Mass. The theme, the message of this the first Mass of Christmas tells of the triumph of God's Son established by him as King and Priest and Judge. This is the Son of God, whose birth upon earth we celebrate tonight. This is our Lord Jesus Christ, the great High Priest, now giving himself in Holy Communion to these boys and young men who are here at Ashur to be trained to share in his priesthood. We take our leave from this college chapel on the top of a Durham fell. Let us recall the message which echoed 2,000 years ago through the hills of Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will. May that peace be yours, in your hearts, in your homes, in your country and in all the world. The celebrant in the High Mass, which you have just seen, was the Right Reverend Monsignor Canon Paul Grant, President of the College. The Deacon was the Reverend David Foscue, and the Subdeacon was the Reverend Thomas Keyworth. The organist was Mr. Anthony Myers, and the choir master was the Reverend Father Lawrence Hollis, Vice President of the College. Introductory and closing commentary was given by Maxwell Dees, and the action of the Mass was described by the Reverend Father Daniel Costa. The service was directed for television by George Adams.